Welcome everyone, my name is Melinda Martin and I'm the Director of Linden New Art. Welcome to Linden New Art's series of professional development seminars for artists and designers. Our Artist Speakeasy program explores a series of topics throughout the year and tonight we're unpacking how to respond to a design brief with the design industry's most exciting practitioners. Tonight, if you're joining us live on Facebook or YouTube, please ask your questions or make comments about the conversation in the chat. And our events and community engagement coordinator, Linda Studena, will monitor and highlight these as we go and bring them up on screen. Before we get started, let me begin with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet virtually today. Today, myself and our guests, Alice Saddington and Thomas Lentini, are joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung or Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne, and Alicia Whitechurch, who is beaming in from the Turbul and Jagara um, people based in Brisbane. So um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And while we meet virtually this evening, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and it reflects the millennia of experiences of First People coming together to celebrate, to make art, to sing, to dance, to learn and to connect. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to First Nations people who are joining us today. Tonight, we are presenting this session in partnership with Design Fringe and Craft Victoria as part of a craft contemporary program, presenting this special professional development session around responding to a design brief. This is a unique opportunity from, to hear from industry professionals on the various aspects to consider when responding creatively to a design brief and how to get your project or idea over the line when you might be pitching it. Our exciting panel features Alice Saddington, a multidisciplinary design who work comes from the multidisciplinary design studio Us from Space, furniture designer Thomas Lentini, and I've just been looking at some of his images and I quite like one of his chairs already, and Alicia Whitechurch, the design pr principal at UOP. So whether you're an emerging or an aspiring designer, this is your chance to ask all those burning questions by chat on the live stream event. Now, I'd like, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first panellist this evening, Alicia Whitechurch. As a principal for the art and design team at UAP, Alicia is responsible for leading the Brisbane design team to creatively meet clients and artist briefs. Having joined UAP in 20, 2009, that seems like a while ago. It is she's, a while ago. <laughs> she's accumulated <laughs> lots of experience working with artists and other creatives to resolve and deliver work for the public realm globally. Um, you were instrumental in establishing UAP's design studio in Shanghai, where you lived with your family for five years. So you must have some yes. good tips about yeah, yeah. life in Shanghai. Now you're back in Brisbane, you're mm -hmm. one of the co-leads of UAP's creative leadership team, responsible for setting the creative agenda for the studio globally, which is pretty exciting. Um, you've led and overseen a number of really interesting projects, both locally and internationally, working with a range of collaborators, including Wahab Al Karama, which I hope mm -hmm. I pronounced correctly yeah, in Abu Dubai. Did. <laughs> with artist Indras Khan, um, Tagalara in Cambodia with PMDL Architects, Kalst yeah. in Saudi, Ar Saudi Arabia, yeah. um, with, in Culver City in the US with artist Chris Doyle, Jeff Coop and David Truebridge, the Springs Development in Shanghai with Tishman Spear. Um, you hold a Bachelor of Product Design from Griffith University and mm -hmm. Queensland College of Art. So Alicia, welcome. To Thank our you evening, so your afternoon in Brisbane. It is. <laughs> um, it's very nice to have you um, being part of this conversation. Yeah, I think one of the first things we should do is really have a little bit, learn a little bit more about UAP because it's one of those really interesting um, organisations that often a lot of people hear about but they don't really know necessarily what you do. Yeah, sure. 
So what I will do is I'll get Linda to play a little bit of a video about what yep. UAP does and then we'll get into a conversation. That sounds wonderful. Thanks, Melinda. It's so interesting to see that work. And I there's so many recognizable public art projects there. Seeing Wendy oh. Lee's work being made in the in the being fabricated is so gorgeous. And if people haven't had a chance, it's a really stunning work to go and see. Alicia, I'm wondering whether you might want to share Maybe. PowerPoint and just talk through some really um, some of the projects that you've been working on and some of the ideas in terms of like yeah. thinking about a design brief as well. I'd love to. Thanks, Melinda. I thought, um, i just wait for that to pop up. I thought what I might do is just start with a little bit of context. I suppose the video gives, um, I suppose, a, a broad overview of what why we love working with artists uh, and creatives and, and how we see our role. But um, if you just flick to the next page for me, um, you'll see... Um, basically, we're, we're a global um, company, New York uh, in the States. We've got our studios in Shanghai and, and in China, here in Australia as well. Um, and, and we have um, curators, we have designers, we have um, project managers, we have uh, fabricators, um, to, you know, to allow us. Looks um, like. all the way through to delivery and install. Can If you just go to the next page, I think, I hope it hasn't, um, it hasn't uh, stuck. There we go. Um, but I suppose where I work predominantly is in the design assist team. So um, I have the pleasure of, of working very directly with artists um, to really um, work through their ideas and make sure that those ideas, you know, are feasible and can be built in the end because, you know, there, nothing is, is more upsetting to me than see beautiful ideas that, that don't end up getting realised because, you know, they, they can't stand up, they can't be engineered, the material's not suitable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's that's where I sort of come into play and it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about and, and have worked doing for, for quite a while now. And if you just move to the next um, phase, I think, you know, we... Um, we work closely with artists. We can render the work, you know, in, in 3D space. We can model it. Um, we can advise on materials and the construction methods. We can look at cost planning and how long that's going to take so to make sure that, you know, it, it's within the client's program that they need that to happen in. Um, we can assist with advising on how it might be installed. If you keep going through, um, once it gets into our workshop phase, if you keep going, um, you know, uh, you know, we've got a, our designers have this beautiful um, array of artisans and specialists that we can draw on um, to help, you know, advise as we're working through the concept to make sure that, you know, we know it can be built. And so our, our delivery team, you know, project managers, they can advise on, again, the budget and how, it, how logistics, you know, maybe it's made um, overseas in one of our Shanghai studios and brought here. 
um, and, and, and how we do that, what those logistics are. Maybe the artist that's here in, in Australia is working on a project overseas or wants to pitch for a project overseas, you know, um, we can advise on some of the complexities that might come with that. Um, you know, there's a whole list of, um, you know, different processes that we're able to assist with. And, and so I think that's just good, I think good context, I think, um, for, I suppose, uh, where we come from when we in the design team, uh, you know, have a, have a design brief that lands on our table. And, and, and quite often, because we have our curatorial team as part of our design assist team, um, often we've got commission art people who wish to commission art coming to our curatorial team and asking them to create um, you know an artist shortlist or an artist brief so often we're writing that brief as well so pretty good um, insight as to is to into how that sort of um, plays out like I was just saying I suppose and we might linger on this slide for for quite a while um, but I suppose the design brief can come to us from quite a few different places. You know, it can come from an artist who's looking to solve a problem to, for me or, um, you know, it can come from a, a, a client. Um, we could be writing that brief. Um, but I think um, in the context of public art, the, the main thing I suppose is um, that we're dealing with is often the complexity of the constraints in the public realm are higher than, for instance, if you're, if you're making, you know, a piece for a gallery, you know, setting, I suppose, um, there's a lot of other external parameters that can sort of influence where you might need to go. Um, I think if you're receiving a design brief, I would suggest this, you know, the basics that I'm sure everybody sort of knows is unnecessary, you know, your site information. That's both, I suppose, that overall context and history um, to give you you know, conceptual response points, as well as things like curatorial frameworks and themes for you to respond to. Um, but also that sort of that sort of micro level as well, the specific site information dimensions and the finishes that are around there and that, you, you know, might inform your material choice, um, you know, uh, that you're receiving potentially a 3D model or architectural plans and, and elevations of the site so you can really understand what you know scale and, and those sorts of things um the the design brief or should always have an indication of budget i think um that because that really does drive in the end you know some of your decision making um and and you know questions you want to be asking are sort of making sure that you understand or what everything that needs to be included in that you know often when you're installing something on site sometimes it's a construction site uh, and, and those sorts of inclusions and exclusions can impact the budget quite quite strongly. Um, you know, so so understanding that uh, in a fair bit of detail is always good. And 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 I, not meaning to plug, but you know, plug UAP. But if you need, you know, if that sort of advice is you know is needed, that's this, exactly the sort of thing that we're able to assist with. So um, so. Uh, I suppose the other thing from a from a design brief that you really want to understand, and if you're delivering a, a concept in particular, is is what you're actually expected to deliver for that concept package. You know, I think, um, and I think this comes down to an effective process. Um, you know, uh, delivering over delivering and, and and sort of is is equally, I think. Uh, can be equally de to detrimental as, as under delivering. Um, I think it's important to remember that um, you delivering just the right amount um, to give confidence that the con that the concept is feasible, but it's not an enormous amount of detailed design that's required. You know, concept design is about providing the intent of the work, getting the client excited about the work. Um, but, um, you know, making sure that it's feasible but, but not going into too much level of detail. There's always a detailed design phase that comes after that um, is, is what I'd suggest. I think um, the other thing maybe to consider is, is, you know, obviously if there's anything you're not sure about with the site is to always ask, but I also understand sometimes, you know, it's not always appropriate to... Um, to respond to some details in sites because they require consultation, for instance, with a landscape designer on site. So you want your work to be 
you know, integrated within the landscape and you want to make some suggestions. Um, I think, uh, you know, don't be afraid to do that and just call out in the document that um, it's an indication and the artist would, you know, appreciate the opportunity in the next stage to consult in more detail with the consultants that are on board uh, rather than trying to undertake that collaboration at that stage, particularly if it's a competitive stage, I think that's quite a difficult undertaking. Um, there's a level of kind of consultation that you can do there and then it, it's about um, providing the intent and going into that detail, you know, hand in hand with the consultants when it's narrowed down to just the one person, I think is a really good um, way to approach that and, and to navigate that. Um, I think the other piece of advice I would suggest is to reach out to your fabricator sooner rather than later in your concept phase. Um, uh, you know, I think um, I, 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 I always feel terribly for the artists when they're reaching out to us, you know, a couple of days before their deadline and, you know, the work is coming in over budget and we're trying to workshop that in a very compressed time frame. It's terribly stressful for them. And, um, you know, and, and most fabricators are, are very generous with um, their advice. If, you know, when they're costing things, they'll ask questions, they might prompt. It might prompt you to think about things that you hadn't considered before that will help firm up the feasibility of your work in the space. So, you know, I would suggest reaching out to the fabricator to understand, um, you know, feasibility and costs sooner rather than later, even if it's a napkin sketch. Honestly, we work on napkin sketches most of the time when we're quoting something or looking and helping to workshop something in the early, early stages of, of concept design. It's, it's uh, not impossible to do. So um, I think... Um, one of the other key pieces of, um, I think, advice that I might suggest is if you've been curated into a project, and this is something that, um, you know, we learnt quite early on, is, is if you've been curated or you've been or have been approached by a, someone who's commissioning work um, and, they, and they've approached you specifically, it's a really, I think it's a really important question to ask um, and that is which pieces of your practice they have responded to. You know, most artists have a fairly varied um, practice and there's a very good chance that if you've been curated into the project or you've been approached that there's someone's already had some thinking around how they could see your work evolving or which pieces they've responded to in the practice. So that can give you some really good insight into, I suppose, where their head is at um, um, in relation specifically to your practice if you've been um, curated or, or um, you know, in, uh, directly approached for a commission. Um, I thought the other thing um, I might touch on is sort of that collaborative process a little bit. I think it's because um, it's a minefield, right? It's a bit of a minefield sometimes for some people and I think, you know, as an artist, it's a very difficult thing to put your work out into the public realm. It's it can be quite scary. I think you know it's um, it's a very it's quite a personal thing to do. I think to to, to build work and then put it into the public realm. Um, so trusting in someone else to collaborate with you to work through how the work might resolve can be quite. Um, a scary thing sometimes and I think certainly we're always approaching um, approaching that process uh, with uh, with that sensitivity in mind I think um, and I just thought if we were to start to flick through some of the other slides there were a few projects and a couple of artists that I've worked with who I think really really um, execute collaboration really well and I think the reason that they do that really well is is not just because they have they have a, a clear vision and but I think when I say having a having a clear vision is important when I say that I think it's not about um, it's not about having every single detail in your mind planned out to the umpteenth degree 
when I when I say a clear vision, I would suggest that means understanding what is really important to you about the concept. And then that allows you to make the decisions um, that align with that. So, for instance, in Florentine's case, we worked with him for the Brisbane Festival Messengers of Brisbane recently. And if you just flick through, there's a little image of, of um one of the Goulian finches that we did. This was a really fun project. You know, it was in the midst of COVID and Brisbane Festival were looking for a way to engage with audiences but understanding that we couldn't have people inside and we couldn't, you know, it couldn't play out the way we couldn't attract crowds to gather. Um, and for Florentine, we, you know, it was, a, it was a reasonably modest budget. So we were trying to find a way to make big impact um, but for Florentine, the thing that was really important to him was that not only was it fun um, and, and lighthearted and made people smile in a time that was very difficult for people, but also that there was, a real, there was as much realism to this as possible. We knew that, um, you know, we weren't then going to be able to bring that down onto the ground and have this intricately detailed sculptural work for the budget because that just those two things weren't weren't aligned the budget and the level of detail that he wanted to achieve so we started to talk about okay so if 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 that's the most important thing to you Florentine then inflatable might be the material choice we can make them of a good scale they can have the impact that you're looking for but then he made the call and said but they can't be down on the ground. They must always be up high on buildings. So, you know, we were digitally printing these quite um, intricately, um, but they were best viewed from a distance to amplify that, that realism. And then he went on to sort of, we started to toy with how else we could um, imbue that more realistic kind of those realistic elements. So, the, the thing that was the most difficult or started to look the most um, unrealistic, I suppose, were if the feet were inflatable. And if you go to the next, um, go to the next slide, oh, sorry, to the next one, we did actually 3D scan um, real Gouldian finches that were from the Queen, from the Queensland Museum, which was a really lovely local touch that he made. But we decided that the feet would be actually sculptural. So these were not inflatable. These were actually made as sculptural objects and, and realistically painted to, you know, add to that effect. And, you know, this was kind of, this was, I think, these, and that the hat was the other object that we, that we did, the feet and the hat that were actually hard, you know, material, realistic material objects, which kind of, I think, was, budget well spent a couple of key details that really helped to kind of elevate that beyond just you know a fully inflatable piece um and if you just keep flicking through but i think um these are just some examples of you know this was just some process um that we undertook the sewing of the pieces but you you know i think that's a really good example i think of an artist really understanding uh what he wanted to achieve what that what was important to him in the project but not getting too bogged down in the details, allowing that collaboration to flow, um, but staying true to what was really important to him. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the outcome was, was fun and successful in the end. And I think if you, the other project that I wanted to chat about very quickly was a similar artist, Ruben, um, who is just the most wonderful artist to collaborate with. Um, uh, we recently worked with him on a project for the Auckland Art Gallery and it's a, a Maori war canoe that he has um, conceived of. Uh, and if you flick to the next page, you can see um, a piece of the piece of in, in the water feature out the front of the Auckland Art Gallery. He, you know, he came to us with the concept and it was vertical in orientation in the middle of the water feature and he wanted it to be entirely clear and made from acrylic. And so the conversation started, okay, so in a, in, in a, in a highly earthquake prone area, how, how can we, what else, what's most important to you, Ruben, you know, is, is the, the clear acrylic the thing that has to stand because then we need to kind of make it horizontal or is the verticality really important? And the verticality was really, really important. So we started to work through with him how we might create a structure that sat inside this piece that was 
mirror polished stainless steel so it reflected all of the surroundings and sort of merged and disappeared with the hundreds and thousands of crystals that he had inlaid into this piece and if you flip through um, a few other pieces you can see all the crystals that were inlaid into it uh, and I think there's another piece. So this is the structure before it had been polished. It was quite hefty, obviously. But in the final images, you know, it really does um, disappear. Uh, you, can, you can see, I'm not sure if you can even see them in that image. They're the, the, the U-shaped pieces, not the, not the, the mm -hmm. horizontal pieces. Um, so, you know, it was, again, I think a really great example of an artist really understanding what was important for him, what that hierarchy of, of importance for his work was, and then that allowed him to make decisions and for us to help him make decisions around that. Um, so that was, they're just really a couple of um, examples of projects and a few tips that I think, you know, I hope are helpful. Uh, and that's it, really. Alicia, thank you. I think there's some really great tips in there. I think the relationship with a the fabricator, they can become, like I know from art projects I've worked on, that relationship is so crucial. Yeah. And often they're lifelong relationships. Once yes. you've found the perfect person in your life, it's a lifelong relationship. The same with an engineer. It can often yep. be the engineering that you require. Mm -hmm. They become really good um, people Definitely. to have in your life just in terms of just the sounding board and really making sure that what you're proposing is possible. Definitely. But also the relationship between those people is also great because great designers and artists will push that ability to actually, you know, stretch and see what is possible in that materiality as well, which I, I think absolutely. is really important. I think that was one of the things that Ruben in particular did really beautifully was every single person that came onto the team, he took the time to sit down and tell them about the story of the work and how meaningful it was to him. And he brought every member of the team into that team as a close knit. They, re they understood the concept, you know, entirely. And it was as meaningful to us and to every single person that touched it you know, as it was to him to deliver it. And I think that's when you get that buy-in from people, that's when you've really got a beautiful team to work with. Um, thank you so much, Alicia. I'm now going to introduce us to the next panellist um, this evening and we'll bring you back for some questions in a moment. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Ella Saddington. Ella is a multidisciplinary designer, artist and curator based in Melbourne and this is always the really weird bit where I actually introduce you on screen so you get to hear your own bio as well. Um, you're a designer and director for Us From Space, an industrial design consultancy that works primarily with bespoke and low volume production and fabrication. Alongside this you also manage to DJ and operate a functional art practice called In Salon an experimental studio that uses research, collaboration and play as a method to speculate on approaches to art, craft and design. Often working with lost or forgotten or overlooked materials, crafts and processes to achieve really innovative outcomes. And I'm really interested to have a chat about some of the work that you're going to talk about in a minute. You're the founder and curator of New Assemblage and organisation to, committed to promoting inclusive and diverse creative community by providing opportunities for emerging practitioners through a program of digital and physical exhibitions. Welcome, Ella. It's really nice Thank to have you with us this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Now, Ella, I know that we've got some images um, that I'm going to ask Linda to share with us of some of the various projects. And so maybe we should start with looking at the images and you just talking through some of those, um, some of that work. Sure. And now I'm just waiting for Linda to bring that up. <laughs> um, so this is uh, part of uh, Us From Space brief that we responded to for a cafe that we work with. Uh, and actually the, the two images that you'll see are both related to that, that brief. So we, we get approached a lot by um, individuals and friends and uh, small businesses to come up with solutions for uh, kind of bespoke or uh, new design pieces that uh, 
suit their budget. Um, so this was actually um, laser cut steel uh, that has been kind of tacked together in this wonderful way that allowed us to make it at low volume for a very affordable price for this little cafe. So that's one we're really proud of. And the next one, next image is uh, of a chair that we collaborated uh, with them on. And um, again, it was all about low volume production methods, what we could physically do in our little workshop. Yeah. Such um, gorgeous images, Ella. And it's really interesting because uh, I've often, I've been that to that particular uh, establishment and admired that furniture. So it's nice uh, that um, to, to see them in the making process as well. Thank you. Uh, and this is just an image from um, the Future Proof exhibition that I curated for New Assemblage um, for Melbourne Design Week. Um, this is where I invite other designers to and uh, uh, actually a lot of the um, participants in this actual exhibition were artists as well. Uh, so it was a lot about that kind of interdisciplinary um, broach between play and uh, design and craft and all of those wonderful things. Uh, but actually on, on the left there, there's a fabulous little uh, machine and that was a Negroni fountain by... Um, one of our artists and it was uh, just a fantastic piece. But uh, yeah, there was 21 different designers and artists that were involved in that exhibition. Um, yeah, and we're on to our second one, which is currently showing at the moment as part of Craft Contemporary as well. That's great, it's really interesting to see. And it's, um, I, I really like the space that you've used as well. Like it's a really nice conversation between the space that's there and the objects in it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then this is a picture from my um, functional art practice. Um, this is quite a personal part of, of my practice. Uh, so these are mirrors that have been made using a heritage mirror making technique. So specifically with Cordon Salon, I collaborate uh, heavily with um, artisans to achieve outcomes that they might not have um thought of or it i guess it's just giving a new perspective to some pretty heirloom crafts um yeah that was uh shown recently at melbourne design week um yes <laughs> and i think it's really beautiful that there's that real connection to uh you know craftsmanship from you know years earlier and that being passed on into a new generation as well is gorgeous definitely yeah there's a lot to be learned from the past i think uh, we tend to look to the future a lot but we can learn from what we're, where we've been and what we've done i like that aspect a lot and should we yep that, that's really great, Ella. Thank you so much for sharing some of those projects. I'm now going to um, invite our next speaker to come in and then I'm going to bring everyone back for a conversation between some of those really interesting projects and hear your kind of experiences of responding to briefs as well because I think that's also something will be really important to share with the audience tonight. Um, I'm now going to say thank you very much, Ella, and introduce you to our next um, established in 2017, Studio Thomas Lentini specialises in the designing and crafting of bespoke furniture. Um, your approach to design is, is particularly unique. Um, you're focused on placing, on creating a friendship with each client in order to understand their style and their requirements and time is, ded is dedicated to site and workshop visits, which reminds me of a commercial gallery dealer I know who says she only works with people who have good hearts. So I feel <laughs> like that's, a, that's something you might have inherited. Um, 
pertinent to design solutions are then presented, followed by prototypes and the realisation of the conversation, the idea that has emerged out of the conversation between you both. Um, this philosophy ensures that each commission undertaken by you is not only the best piece you've ever made, but it's also accompanied by this really gorgeous narrative. Um, you completed a diploma in furniture design and technology in 2011, followed by the associate degree of furniture design in 2012 at RMIT. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Melinda. Cheers. Um, and also, um, I'd like to say, yeah, it's it's wonderful to listen to um, Ella and both and Alicia as well um, to see how unique uh, our approaches are and how our disciplines differ um within the creative industry i think it's really really fantastic um and also just on the note of ella as well i uh, my partner um also has one of her amazing lights um which is yeah it's a beautiful beautiful thing um to have but um yeah it's been it's it's wonderful to be a part of this evening so thank you and Thomas, maybe we'll just talk through some of the images that Linda's put together of your work and maybe you can talk through some of those projects yeah, to sort of tell us a little bit more about them. Wonderful. So, yeah, this um, this is a desk that I produced uh, last year um, in between lockdowns. Um, but the design itself uh, was actually um, it's something that arose yeah, fr that, from a design brief back in twenty early 2019 um, and that followed on uh, from a dining table commission. Um, so essentially, yeah, the, the, the brief itself um, from the client was they wanted a freestanding desk uh, for the centre of their room um, that wasn't heavy um, and it was also um, not long after the first time I'd ever been given the opportunity to apply colour. Uh, to solid timber, which um, coming from a, a craft background and a particular woodworking background, um, a lot of my older peers, it's sort of a no-no um, because, you know, you're covering the sole um, of the timber and that sort of thing. But what it was, it was a, yeah, it was a wonderful opportunity to, um, yeah, to, to try and, and push things a little bit further. So um, essentially, yeah, this, this piece, um, yeah, front room of a house can be seen from the street as well, depending on the time of day and if uh, if they choose to have their uh, their shutters all the way open. But um, but yeah, it had to be a dynamic shape as well. So for this particular piece and design, originally the client uh, he had a built-in um, section of cabinetry behind him, so he could swivel swivel around to a larger desktop. Um, but what his preferred method was, was a, a MacBook Pro in the middle, a little iPad, and then a, a notebook off to the side um, as well. So, and yeah, he's a very sort of fast paced, um, action packed sort of person. So um, wanted a bit of, yeah, a bit of funk and pizzazz. So for, for the initial um, finish of, um, I suppose, Mark one of this design um, was in a beautiful Pantone half torp grey, uh, the colour was called, and you'll actually see another piece which was the first iteration of that colour that I ever used as well back in uh, 2019. But uh, this this follow up in the green was actually um, a slight a slight variation of that original design brief, and I loved it so much that the green one I actually made for myself. So um, <laughs> I've never ever done that before where I've repeated a design. Um, for anyone, um, but I thought I, I actually spoke to the client. And I said, "Look, I'm a, I'm going to make one for myself when I have the opportunity." So um, that that happened last year. But um, but uh, yeah, so we could potentially yeah um, shuffle across again. So um, yeah, these are some a couple of coffee table uh, concepts. Pretty pretty wild. Again, you can see the use of color um, bottom there um, on the right hand side of screen that's a solid american walnut uh, dining table um, and in regard to that particular piece um, there's another image it may not be in this um, particular slideshow but that table again um, in, re in responding to a brief um, and a little bit within regard to my bio as well so that particular client um, was introduced to me and they had um, moved into a really cool converted warehouse um, not far from from where i'm based um, just in north fitzroy 
And the brief of that piece uh, is, again, a response to a space, but also um, how the piece would be seen and experienced um, as you walked around it. And walking into the first floor of the studio, you'd be coming up a, an almost a sort of spiral staircase. Um, and so with this particular design, the entire underside and framework um, of the table was basically a feature. Um, and then once you came up to the, the table, um, yeah, we wanted, the client had seen some previous work of mine, which you can see in all three of these images. I really like, like the idea of sort of nesting and cradling and those sort of architectural motifs. And um, they, that couple asked if I could include that idea um, from a previous piece, but um, again, adapt it and play around with it. So I was given an opportunity to, to keep evolving um, that sort of style and, um, and that idea. So um, yeah, and uh, so yeah, this is actually, this has been a nice one to chat about as well and getting back to um, the design brief side of things. So uh, most of my work uh, is through uh, some architects that I, I work quite cl uh, closely with now. Um, there are quite a few interior designers as well, but I always find um, architects um, have the most bold <laughs> sort of ambitious uh, briefs for me. And uh, this particular one, this was produced um, in the middle of this year, but where, how this began and what I was given originally was just the number of people that needed to be seated, um, which I believe in the end, this is a 14 to 16 seater. Um, and yeah, essentially what I, uh, what I was given originally is the, uh, plans for the space, um, a quick sort of intro on what they were thinking about with regard to palette of the chairs. And then, yeah, then I was invited to, uh, the studio, we would look at the palette of the overall space. And from there, um, I, yeah, they just said, look, we're happy now that you've seen our plans. They also sent me some 3D renderings as well, just to sort of get a, a sense of the, the scale of the space. Um, Cause obviously, yeah, this, this piece ended up being four and a half meters in length. So um, quite unique um, in terms of scale as well for a domestic setting. So uh, yeah, we've got to experience, um, yeah, what, what we might be working with um, from a, from a professional rendering perspective. So uh, was given, time to come up with, I think for this particular commission, there might've been uh, three or four different um, concepts. Um, again, with the way I work, usually it's a sort of a six month process from first discussion to final outcome. Um, so usually there'll be a couple of weeks of very quick and initial concept development. Um, so I won't spend too much time, but enough time to convey an idea and really make sure that we're on board. And then from that, that, that's the beauty of also working with architects and interior designers is, uh, you know, they are, they are entrusted by their client to really help um, make decisions and, and guide them as to what would work best with their space. So yeah, once we, once we found an idea um, that everyone was happy with, then I was given, you know, a couple more weeks to really hone in on the finer details. Um, and then of course, the final thing is um, finish and selection um, and so uh, with this particular piece, yeah, being a four and a half meter table, it's um, yeah, solid American white oak, but um, extremely difficult to get lengths uh, this long. They only come in a couple of times a year from the States. Um, so you've got to be pretty quick. So again, we had to really respect what was going to be available um, and yeah, how scarce it was. And thankfully everything sort of lined up uh, for this particular piece. So, um, yeah. Um, and yeah, in this next slide, uh, we have, uh, on the left-hand side. So that is the, uh, that color I mentioned earlier, that Pantone half top gray. And the reason I've included that, um, particular image, um, that was sort of a, a game, a complete game changing, uh, uh, commission for myself. So, uh, that was a wonderful client that I, I had been introduced to um and they said look we know you tend to work with natural finishes and yeah you know solid timber but would you be potentially interested in coming to see our space and uh taking a look at what you think uh and have you ever worked with a solid color finish and at that point i hadn't so 
Uh, we, again, we must have um, come, come up with at least half a dozen uh, new finishes over uh, solid timber. So in this particular instance, the tabletop is American white ash and uh, yeah, the, the base, the legs are powder coated steel. But again, we sort of um, waited for the, the house to get to a point where it was essentially finished and then we could lay out all of the uh, yeah, relevant samples and, and just sort of um, deduct as we went along. And uh, we ended up on that, that beautiful uh, Pantone finish. So that, that sort of paved the way for me to really uh, not be afraid of, of pursuing color um, over a traditional material. Um, and also, yeah, starting to work with steel and, uh, and yeah, getting a bit more fun, I suppose, and, and a bit more <laughs> sculptural with my design work. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I, Melinda, is there, uh, I suppose, uh, some other questions that, yeah. I there are some answer. other questions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring everyone else back into the yeah. conversation I think now to have, to sort of have a have an interesting conversation between all of you um I love the fact that of the idea of a table it is my dream to just have a clear table with just you know <laughs> a notebook and a computer yeah. and I don't I don't even want to show you my desk because the <laughs> humiliation of what it looks like and my you know as aspiration to be a Japanese Zen minimalist are uh, not being quite met at the moment. <laughs> but I really love that kind of idea. I'm really interested, I guess, in terms of, I think, and I think probably for the audience, like what are the pitfalls? Like when do you, I guess, Alicia or, or Thomas or Ella, when do you think, mm, this is going to be a this is going to be a problem project. This isn't going to kind of work out. Maybe for you, Ella. Like, is there has it? Have you ever had, um, you know, a response to a design brief where suddenly you're like, oh, I don't think this is going to work for me. I don't think this is a good relationship for me to kind of pursue. Yeah, I tend to find that comes out pretty early on. I'm mm -hmm. quite selective in who I choose to work with. I've always found that if it's if it doesn't kind of come naturally, then it tends I'm not sort of the right fit for that person and then just trying to be the right fit will not work in the long run anyway. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I've always sort of identified it pretty early on in the um, relationship. <laughs> yeah. And what yeah. about you, Thomas? Have you ever found that there's, you know, you're trying to make something work and it just doesn't, like for whatever reason, doesn't gel? Yeah, look, I think um, I would like to take it back to a point that Alicia made earlier on, which is um, discussing budget with clients. So certainly um, early on, it's established, yeah, pretty quickly. So um, when a client or a prospective client uh, reaches out for the first time, they'll usually um, send me a reference of another piece I've made and they'd say, look, we're after something similar, but for 10 people or 20 people or three people. Um, and then essentially, yeah, I'll, I'll just put that question forward and say, um, you know, what, what were you hoping to spend or invest and, um, and what, what budget are you working with? And then I would say, look, we can make X, Y, or Z work for that budget. So, um, but in terms of a technique, um, coming from a technical side as well, there are certainly projects that I've worked on. Um, and there's one quite recently as well, that's extremely ambitious, um, in the way it's been put together and um and yeah i have to consult um some mentors along the way or um people that have done something similar before and and uh and sort of reassess and readjust um but i think in terms of um and uh yeah i suppose yeah <laughs> sorry i just had a bit of a blank no, there, no. But, oh. i think that's I think there's this really important aspect of just really good, clear communication at the very start about expectations, yeah. which I think is really important. Um, expectations for the designer, but also expectations that you can do it within that budget. And I think the money aspect's really important. And often as artists or designers, people get really excited to be included in the project. But if you can't make it work or you're actually going to do it at a loss, it's kind of... It's just going to cause more stress and, and kind of um, heartache. Alicia, I'm wondering for you, working with a lot of artists, and I mean, you work with artists translating often, um, 
creative processes that aren't necessarily meant to be functional items but meant to be art projects. What are some of the challenges you found or some of the things that you see that can be problems early on? Oh, hang on. I think you are mute. Hang on a second. I'm going to unmute you or you'll have to unmute. That was me. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> my, my... <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I do think that um, it is setting up that. It's this. It's really the same. I think it's that setting up of the project from the outset and and being really honest about you know, I, I think that's how relationships are built. Those relationships are built, you know, that you can be really upfront and frank about what is feasible and what isn't feasible. I think that, you know, artists will generally respect and and that relationship builds from there because and I think as long as you're, as long as you are, um, you know, trying to find the best solution and you're working to find the best solution and you're putting the options on the table, um, I think uh, that relationship will continue to build. I think that, that that it is that clear communication and those upfront, sometimes they're difficult conversations upfront, you know, and I would think better to have them and sooner than, you know, sometimes you just try to keep finding some, the solution, keep finding the solution, and, and then to break the news later that you can't find the solution is more difficult. So I, I agree um, having those clear conversations and and money is always the I always like joke if it wasn't for the budget oh god what what could we do you know uh but you know at the same time constraints are a good thing too you know sometimes it's the constraints we all know you know that sometimes it's those constraints that actually make it really amazing and there's an outcome there that you're like wow I didn't even think that that was possible and look how amazing that is and I, and I thought that that constraint was actually a bad thing but it turned out to be an amazing thing so um, yeah, that's that was a roundabout way of answering that question. No, I no, think. It, that's really great. <laughs> We've just got a question in um, from someone who's really interested in timelines and I'll get Linda to bring it up. And I guess it's really that kind of, you know, and maybe if we could talk about a couple of projects that um, Ella and Thomas you've worked on, maybe um, Thomas, to start with that, you know, the table for 14 people, that is a large family, can I say? Yeah. <laughs> What's the... <laughs> and I uh, bet there's, yeah, a lot so... of, there's a lot of uh, plates and cutlery that go with that. What's the timeline for you in terms of, like, um, being kind of briefed on the project and then the delivery of that um, that project? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, with, with each piece, it's quite unique, but... Um, for these, that particular table um, and that particular architect in the last year, I've worked on three uh, tables that have been from four and a half metres up to six metres in length, um, all for domestic settings and all for 14 up to 22 people. And with all of those, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm still a one man, uh, one person show. So I have to really, yeah, planning and, and lead times are, are very, very important. Um, and thankfully, with these jobs in particular, uh, we usually start the planning process again from sort of six months, perhaps earlier. But from a production perspective, um, usually what I do is when it comes time for me to sort of get started or knowing how long I need to complete a project, uh, it's a matter of coordinating with the architects and the project managers or developer as well. Um, and so, uh, what will happen, uh, yeah, I'll give them a heads up to say, look, I'm ready to start or this is how long I'll need. Um, and they'll give me the call to say, uh, yeah, get started. But usually uh, for a piece like the one we saw in the slideshow, that's something that I'll allow at least four weeks of production time for once everything's been signed off and and, uh, and I'm ready to go. So, But it changes every time. Right. And Ella, maybe if we, I'm thinking like the Napier quarter might be a good example in terms of like a timeline from like when uh, the owners come and talk to you about like this is what we're thinking and, and yeah. then to deliver. Yeah, so I guess we started talking concept um, and I guess sort of outlining what their, their needs were as far as... Um, how they needed to use them in the space or store them away. Um, and then also started discussing a little bit of materials and aesthetic pretty early on. 
Um, but I guess the project kind of happened within about a three month period. It was pretty fast um, once we started working on it because uh, we like to get into the workshop and do prototyping and design as fast as possible because uh, uh, the sooner we have that, the sooner we can kind of eliminate and point the direction of where we want to to work or what's working or not working. Um, and once you're in the workshop, it's it's actually quite fast. <laughs> um, for us, at least, we we do a lot mm -hmm. um, with us from space. We do a lot of metal fabric fabrication, um, which is an extremely fast way to work with with things. But um, yeah, it's great. And Alicia, I'm wondering maybe if you talked about maybe the timeline for Florentine. So the kind of like approach from Brisbane Festival for a project, kind of then, I guess you know, identifying the, the artist and then yeah. kind of delivering the final project. What kind of timeline was that? Um, so that was in total, but because that was an inflatable production, which is quite quite quick, um, the total time frame for that was sort of, I think from memory, about 10 months or so. But um, we also had, in this instance, I suppose some, in some instances we're curating artists into a project. Brisbane Festival obviously have their own artistic director and creative directors as well. So in this instance, um, Brisbane Festival came to us with Florentine already um, selected. Mm -hmm. And so we worked through um, a sort of a more technical phase with him um, and um, our engineers. There was quite a lot of wind loading and engineering, obviously, um, to consider there. These pieces are transportable. They need to be their touring. So packing down, packing, you know, all those sorts of things had to be considered as part of the design. And then there was also sort of all the 3D scanning that had to be done of the actual finches when we went into um, the Queensland Museum and and that that whole sort of beautiful process that kind of made it a little bit more special, I think. So, um, yeah, in total that was about, it was a 10 months, so I think it was from memory. But generally, you know, I think if we're looking at a concept phase, we would usually, you know, because, you know, there's a briefing with the artist and then the artist needs time to go and think about the idea. So that's sort of at least two or three weeks to give them some space to think about it. And then they'd usually send us some initial concepts or sketches at that point. And then we'd take a couple, you know, two or three weeks to then work through visualisation and um, some advice and, and estimation and that sort of thing, pulling together a presentation for the artist. Um, and then there's usually a technical design phase where we're doing, you know, engineering and further consultation and refinement of materials and um, you know, all the technical technical drawings and things like that. And then we move into production and fabrication. So it's sort of a three-phase um, process, generally speaking, um, for us. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. And I hope, Joanne, that really answers um, the question. I think it's a really interesting question because it's often how long is a piece of string. I'm also really interested in this idea of relationships because I think all of you have touched on the importance of those relationships where sometimes you need, you know, Thomas, you talked about mentors going to sort of seek advice about particular material aspects. Mm -hmm. Ali, you've talked about like other craft um, craftsmanship and other practitioners and kind of um, bringing back older styles of making. Tell me about how you find those relationships and how important they are in terms of like you being able to realise the projects. Maybe Ella, if you start, I'm thinking about like the beautiful mirrored project. How did you, how did that start? Uh, oh, it was, it was a bit of a uh, um, interesting start uh, of a relationship because I, I actually, I guess I maybe identified about three or four years ago that I had, um, I was working with some people that I didn't really enjoy working with. And I just kind of had enough. And so <laughs> it, it, that project um, specifically came out of, I found this fabulous artisan person who makes this incredible hand poured mirror. Uh, and I really liked him and he, we, we got along really, really well. And I think that kind of uh, relationship is naturally conducive to mm. developing good things. Uh, yeah, so it, it's very personal. I, I find the relationships um, that I make with either 
uh, architects or interior designers that specify work for us is, or people that we uh, subcontract to, or even down to the, the people who we uh, um, get to do our laser cutting. They're all people that we enjoy interacting with on a daily basis. We don't really have time <laughs> to to not have nice yeah. people around us. So yeah, it's very much my motivation. And I think also when we're work, when you're working with very often tight deadlines in stressful situations where you might have a number of other players, those that importance of those relationships and that trust that you've built up yeah. over time, I think is and really a lot of important. That's communication as well is just mm. if you have the right level of communication and sometimes it's just a matter of somebody's a lovely person but you can't communicate because you just come from two different perspectives or different mm. ways of communicating it doesn't mesh um yeah. so just kind of finding people that speak your language and thomas mm. what about you i think you talked about reaching out to mentors about like is this possible can i do it what's what's your kind of approach yeah, absolutely. So I, I like also what Ella touched on there in terms of um, relationships with suppliers or subcontractors being really important. Um, but getting uh, back to your question of, um, yeah, people that I reach out to with regard to project questions um, and that sort of thing. So um, going through, um, yeah, RMIT um, for a couple of years and then following that, I did four years in a pretty small and specialised workshop and uh, yeah, became close with um, quite a few people that were a little older than myself, but um, and a lot of people understand coming from team backgrounds or collaborative environments that sometimes there are certain things that uh, no matter how long you spend on your own, um, it's great to just bounce an idea um, or a process or a, or a concept um, of, of, or a way of doing something off someone. So. I've got, yeah, a couple of people um, that aren't too much older than myself, but I really like the way that they approach uh, concepts and, and process, uh, production process. Um, so that's, yeah, that's been wonderful. Um, and then just touching and sort of bouncing off what Ella mentioned too, I've got a, uh, a couple of people that I really rely heavily on from a um, subcontracting and relationship perspective of my main timber supplier, uh, which is a really small business and who imports, um, you know, phenomenal American hardwood species. So yeah, really working uh, with him and uh, yeah, teeing up things again, you know, months and months in advance, or if it is a last minute thing, you know, you've got that trust and they've got that respect um, that you can call them up for a solid and say, <laughs> can I come in this afternoon for a single length of something? Um, and again, that I also have someone that does um, a fair portion of my finishing or, or lacquering. So I don't have a spray booth in my workshop. So I work closely with um, a small team out in Eltham. Um, and again, the amount of times for deadlines, particularly towards uh, the end of the year and that sort of thing um, have been extraordinary. But I thought I'd just quickly mention as well um, from the introduction you gave of me, Melinda, um, relationships with clients as well I think is the most important and I've been really privileged over the last four years that I've been out on my own um, that because yeah a lot of the outcomes well I like to think all of them are unique but some are particularly special um, and it's really wonderful that because it is such a long process so I've mentioned sort of six months to a year sometimes um, when it's all done it's just so special for them uh, to sometimes uh, yeah invite me back you know, for a drink, you know, for a whiskey, sit at the <laughs> table that I've made for them. Um, and sometimes, you know, it'll be multiple visits or, um, and if it's not that, then what I think speaks more highly um, is, is referral based work as well. So a lot of those relationships lead to commissions from friends or family um, or colleagues. So I think mm. um, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. And again, uh, touching back is, I think it's, you tend to connect with like-minded people that love a narrative. Yeah. So something mm. that, yeah, takes uh, a lot of time, but people see the care um, and the ups and downs, certainly. Um, there's a lot of that as well. Um, but, yeah, um, so I hope that helps yeah, for anyone that's listening. <laughs> and I think also, like, from Alla and Thomas's conversations just there, I think it's also those people become almost like your marketing arm. 
as well. Like yeah, absolutely. In, in a way that kind of like people, you know, will, will comment about, oh, where did you get this beautiful table? And if they can tell that story on your behalf, you don't have to spend all that money or or time actually doing it yourself. They've kind of become that kind of support um, yeah. work. Alicia, I'm really interested in, I guess, you know, you work with a lot of artists with different personalities, different <laughs> kind of experiences and backgrounds. Do you kind of, I guess because of, of the production team that you have and, and it's a worldwide production team, do you often have to kind of think about those interpersonal relationships and who you get people to work with as well? Is that part of what you do yeah. in terms of your project management? Absolutely. I think it's that sort of happens naturally to some degree as well. You know, but I do, There, you know, certainly there are some personalities that work better with others and, and um, you know, often you'll work on a particular project and trust is built in that project and that artist will want to continue to work with a particular designer or a particular person on the floor that they, you know this I think comes back to Thomas's point also that it's that that narrative people that people you know that is really important I think when someone is connected to what you're doing and they believe in it and it touches them and they feel it and they empathize with it it's you, you're there you know like they will go the extra mile for you they will you know try to make it work no matter what you know I think um but it's funny I would get that question quite I get a lot of questions about you know um difficult artists and that sort of thing I mean <laughs> I I actually find very few difficult artists you know they're they're really and that they get a bad rap for artists they really do they're not they're not difficult I think they're actually um it's it's almost it's almost always joy I think when you're working with them uh you know there's a sensitivity there that I think well you know a lot of our team uh connect with so yeah um I'm wondering if because we're just about to sort of close off and I'll, I'll just see if there's any other questions but I'm wondering if you were you know, if you could go back and talk to, you know, your starting out self when you first started out in um, these gigs in terms of the kind of work, I guess, Ella and Thomas, what kind of piece of, of advice would you have given now from where you're sitting, would you give your younger self about what to do? Because I think there's probably a number of people in the audience who are starting out in their careers, they're early and emerging designers. What kind of advice would you have gone back to give your younger self Bella uh I I think definitely following my curiosity or uh specifically targeting things that uh, and projects that really interest and inspire me because I think you learn a lot um and you're also invested a lot more in things that really motivate you um so taking on more of those early on mm. rather than being, I may maybe concerned with uh, getting the bills paid. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's always a balance, but mm. uh, yeah, I'd take on more of those passion things early on. I'd have to say. And what about you, Alicia? What kind of advice would you go back and give your your younger self? Um, it's funny. I was talking. I was just talking to Lindy Lee about this the other day. We were talking about how you learn that projects go through ugly stages <laughs> and not to be deterred when it hits the ugly stage like it does it's the idea isn't born beautiful when you put it down on paper often you know things aren't quite right or you're getting through the visualization stage and it's something's a little bit odd and it's not working and you're like oh is this what I thought it was um stick with it persevere through it keep moving through that ugly stage I think we were laughing about you know and just understanding you know that sort of um uh the the empathy that's required you know being kind to yourself when you're putting something out in the public realm you know try not to get too anxious about it you know your work is beautiful your work is good it is good it's good enough to go out there just put it out there um yeah that would be that would be my <laughs> advice and thomas what would you do what what would you give uh, the young thomas yeah, look, I I think um, in hindsight it would have to be um, because I'm a I'm a sole operator, uh, sole trader. So um, I would my advice 
uh, to the audience for anyone wanting to pursue um, their discipline and craft or art as a sole operator, I would highly, highly recommend uh, looking for a mentor early on. Um, I've something I've only done recently to help with really uh, trying to develop my business further, but also identify my weaknesses. Um, sort of obviously everyone will, will do a business plan, but I think if you can have someone um, there from the start to really help with the operational side of things, because generally, particularly in the creative industry, we are all really talented. We're, we're not scared of working hard. We're not scared of doing what we love and finding a way to do what we love for a living. But I think um, the, the little one percenters, um, I think there are a few of those which if I had have had it together a little better in the early days, things would be a little different now, not necessarily better, but I think I'd have a better understanding of how to deal with certain challenges um, mm -hmm. that, um, that uh, you know, that come with it operating. Um, and again, being, being a, a one person show, it's uh, sometimes you can feel pretty, uh, pretty snowed in, but, Gee, it, when it when it goes well, it's there's nothing better as well. So I think yeah, don't don't be afraid to approach someone um, that can perhaps help you and guide you through um, and make sure you're you're set up to succeed. I suppose yeah, um, that would be my best advice to my early self. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's all very sound advice. I think there's also something about being curious, like not having all the answers. And I think when yeah, you're young, so you really want to do it all, but sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. it's actually just slowing it down and allowing for those yeah. experiences to occur. Mm -hmm. I wish that's what I, that's what I would tell my younger self. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been so lovely to see Paola and Thomas and Alicia, the work that you are all making and doing. It's so inspiring to see that creativity and such really interesting outcomes of people having really divergent careers and practices. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, it was really great to have you with us. Um, it, this brings our program to the end. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being part of the conversation tonight. I'd really like to thank our partners, Craft Victoria and Craft Contemporary, of which we're part of this evening. The team at the Melbourne Fringe Festival, who've had to reinvent an entire festival um, because of a COVID lockdown. Um, they are brave beyond belief. Um, and our fabulous Design Fringe supporters who've made this very possible, the City of Port Phillip, Creative Victoria, the Naomi Milgram Foundation, the Victorian Women's Trust and our education partner, Monash University. And thank you for everyone joining us tonight. Um, it's great to have people joining us live as part of the conversation. If you haven't visited Linden yet, um, you can catch our exhibitions online at the moment. We've got some great exhibitions by Natasha Binyak, Ruth Holfik, Vipu Srivalasa and Carolyn Menzies. Um, we also have this incredible public art project out on the streets at the moment um, called Designers on Your Doorstep. So check out some of Melbourne's leading uh, designers um, with some great posters with a QR code that you can scan and find out all about them, including their favourite drink recipe and favourite design objects. So there's some nice things to discover on your walks around Melbourne at the moment. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Thanks so much, much, Melinda. Thank you.